Welcome to the latest episode of Naked Neuroscience, the podcast exploring the workings of the brain and the nervous system in our bodies and beyond. I'm Katie Haler. And this month... If you have a very complex thing, sometimes you can say it much better on a drum or you can play it very gently, like in a symbol of touching. You can express much more sensitive with your senses what is inside, which is unspeakable. And that is something that makes music incredible. Can music actually be medicine? We're tuning in to the therapeutic properties of tunes, plus we'll be picking apart some of the latest neuroscience research with the help of our local experts. Let's jump straight into some naked neuroscience news with cognitive neuroscientist Duncan Assel from Cambridge University and perceptual psychologist Helen Keyes from Anglia Ruskin University. First up, and right on theme, Helen looked at a paper about whether musical training can improve your ability to filter out irrelevant information and focus on the task at hand. We know quite a lot about how music shapes the brain, but we don't know anything yet about how music affects your attention. So we know that music can actually change your brain structure in in ways that have to do with music. So they can change the auditory cortex. If you're uh, musically trained, it can make changes in your brain that lead to you being better at recognising melody and tempo changes, things that you might expect. And slightly uh, more interesting is that those skills can transfer into other auditory Um, skill improvements such as being able to recognize uh, speech in a jumbled noisy um, environment so there's a slight transfer already known um, from these skills but this paper was being a bit more ambitious looking at whether musical training can transfer to other cognitive skills and lead to improvements in your attentional skills okay well how do they go about trying to do that then well they looked at 18 professionally trained musicians who were pianists and compared them to 18 non-musicians and these samples were matched for age and gender and they asked the participants to carry out an attentional network test to measure their executive control function. So in this test your job would be to say whether a centrally presented arrow was pointing to the left or right. A very easy task but that arrow would be surrounded by other arrows. Sometimes they'd be pointing in the same direction as the central arrow so they'd be congruent and sometimes they'd be pointing in the opposite direction to the central arrow so incongruent. Now this task is very easy if all the arrows are pointing the same way, but if the central arrow is pointing in, in, in a different way from the distractor and um, flanking arrows, it can take you a little bit longer to focus your control on, on the central arrow and, and put the irrelevant distracting information out of your mind. So that's what this test was measuring and they found that musicians were more efficient at ignoring the distractor arrows and focusing on the task at hand and getting the answer right more quickly, the direction that the central arrow was pointing. If being a musician is good for our ability to attend to things, does that mean we should all be teaching our kids to play the piano? It depends on your perspective. So I would say yes, you know, teach for success. This is a great idea. The tiger parents are correct. So the idea that if you teach your child or train your child um, to have a sustained attention on a musical task, this might Uh, transfer over to other cognitive skills and their ability to to focus their attention better however I'm sure other psychological colleagues would point out that this uh, can also have negative impacts of putting too much pressure on your children but from a purely cognitive point of view yes this is a very good idea. Duncan? I always think with these sort of natural experiments the chicken and the egg problems and how do we know for sure that it's the musical training that's causing these cognitive changes over time and not that these cognitive differences are there anyway and they emerge at different points and in different ways across the lifespan and that's why they seem to co-occur with the musical playing. I mean this is an excellent question and it's addressed by the paper in two ways. So firstly they ran additional analyses to show that the number of years of musical training that you have is strongly correlated with this improved cognitive function. So that that suggests that it might be the training that's driving the effect. 
But I think you're right. It's it's very difficult to say, you know, especially with classically trained musicians, whether it's, you know, an educational effect or something else happening here to drive this. The only study that I can think of that would support the idea that it's the training driving the improvement is um, a study that looked at 70 children who were between the ages of five and seven. And some of these children showed an interest in taking up musical training and some of them didn't. And at that particular stage, no differences, no cognitive differences or um, musical differences even were observed in that group at that stage. So it's not fantastically concrete evidence, but it is suggesting that you can take people with the same baseline and musical training can perhaps um, have this positive effect. Helen Keyes there. And we'll be coming back to music a little later on. Now, the human brain is amazingly complex, and a core question in neuroscience is how these billions of neurons can perform a variety of cognitive tasks in different ways. The mapping between the brain and these different tasks is not straightforward. For example, a small amount of damage to one person's brain could significantly affect their cognition. But the inverse could be true in someone else. Now, scientists have actually built an artificial brain in order to study this mapping. So, first question, how on earth do you build a brain? A brain cell in this um, pretend brain is, imagine it just like a, a circle on a piece of paper, we could draw it out, but at a computational level, it's just a simple equation, and usually it's a learning equation, so it takes information in, and it adjusts itself depending upon what it's uh, what it's just received, and then it sends on a message or an answer to the equation onto the next neuron, and so on. And so we can then imagine that we have a whole sheet of those neurons, a whole sheet of those circles, each with, a, with an equation. And then, of course, we can layer the sheets up to create multiple different layers of our pretend neural network. And that, in essence, is how the simulation works. Okay, so you've got this pretend brain, this highly complex system. What did they do with it? Well, they trained this uh, pretend system to perform multiple different cognitive tasks by giving the, the brain input and then checking its output. And gradually, over many thousands of iterations, they managed to train it to perform 20 different tasks, some memory tasks, some inhibition tasks, some attention tasks, um, some target detection tasks. And when they had trained it to perform these different tasks, they could then explore what has this um, neural network learnt and how is it able to do this? And they found some really important things. So the first amazing thing is that it can do it is that it can be so flexible that it can perform these 20 different tasks really well. That is a first, and that's surprising. The second thing they learnt is that naturally emerge these different types of neurons or different types of brain cells within the network that are for different functions. So, for instance, some of them seem to be really important for the inhibition tasks. Others seem to be really important for the memory tasks, just like you might expect to find in the real brain. Third thing they found is that some of the tasks will share neurons. So there seem to be some general purpose neurons. Um, We know that's true in the real brain also. The fourth thing they learned was that the system learned to combine different clusters of networks to perform really complex tasks. So it learned that you can perform really complex tasks by combining much simpler tasks. Again, that's something that the real brain does too. And finally, they were able to show that you can damage this simulated brain in different ways. And the patterns of impairment to performance that that will produce are really similar to the patterns that you get when um, real people experience brain damage. So there's some really key, surprising and kind of quite groundbreaking findings from their analysis. First of all, that's amazing. We've got a pretend brain going on in a computer. Looking ahead, What kinds of applications could this be used for? Could you get to the stage where if it's good enough, you can test out treatments on a pretend brain before testing it on a real brain? I think artificial intelligence often gets a really bad rap. You know, it's going to steal your credit card details and steal your job and so on. But actually, it's an amazingly powerful tool that we can use to all sorts of brilliant um, ends. So from a scientific perspective... It gives us a great way of exploring how the brain might work and and provides us with a way of interrogating that system in a way that you can't do with a real human being. So, for instance, in our lab, when we're designing new tasks or new experiments, we not only run them with human beings, we also run them 
using these kinds of simulations so that we can compare and contrast how the two systems are doing it. So that means that we make a lot more progress in our understanding of what's really going on under the bonnet. Um, and you can start to simulate things. So for example, um, maybe we could simulate different kinds of environments that children might grow up in by simulating the way in which we train the network. And that's the kind of thing that we would never be able to do as an experiment ourselves. But because we can simulate a brain, we can experiment with it in all sorts of incredible ways to reveal new insights about how the brain works, how it develops, how it recovers from damage, and potentially, in theory, um, what kinds of interventions might be beneficial to create a more robust or a more resilient system in the future. Is it fair to say that even though this pretend brain is incredibly sophisticated, there's always going to be room for a bit of human error? Because I guess there's always going to be a coder behind the the equations that have gone into it in the first place. In essence, even as complex and sophisticated as this particular simulation is, it's still not a patch on the real thing. So the human brain is the most complex computational piece of equipment that known in the universe. And so simulating it in this simple way is really useful from a scientific perspective, but it would always be a bit of a simplification relative to the real thing. That doesn't mean it's not useful, it still is massively useful. But it's never going to be, you know, 20 different tasks. You and I can perform a lot more than 20 different tasks. Um, and I think we'll always struggle to produce a full simulation, but this could still be really useful. Duncan Assel there. And as usual, if you want to read up on those stories in more detail, you can find the links on the Naked Scientist website, nakedscientist.com slash neuroscience. And if there's some neuroscience news you want us to look at or you've got a question you'd like us to address, get in touch. You can email neuroscience at nakedscientists.com. So what we were trying to do with this paper is to demonstrate the ability to type using brain signals, anywhere between approximately four and approximately eight words per minute, a factor of between two and four faster than what's been demonstrated before. Each month, the eLife podcast talks to some of the world's best scientists. Join me, Chris Smith, as I hear about breathtaking discoveries hot off the press. Find the eLife podcast on iTunes or listen and download for free from nakedscientist.com slash eLife. Whether it's basement jacks or Beethoven, jazz or punk rock, every day billions of us enjoy listening to and playing music. But can this ancient art form be used therapeutically to benefit our health? This month, Naked Neuroscience is putting music therapy under the microscope. First up, to find out exactly what happens in a music therapy session... I met up with Jörg Fachner, Professor of Music, Health and the Brain at the Cambridge Institute of Music Therapy Research at Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge. Music therapy has different approaches. So let's say the music therapy which is based on making music together and then discussing about music or not discussing on, on what you have done. So let's say when you just make music together, you are in a non-verbal space, interacting with the other one. You may think, well, I'm, I'm not able to play that, but rhythm is kind of something that everybody can use, a rhythmic activity. So we are basing a lot on the rhythmic activity when we're playing music together. And it does not mean that you need to be sophisticated on the instrument. You can just hack on a piano. Then, of course, the therapist would just join in and try to get the pace of your whatever you do on the piano, you know. When you start playing single notes, the therapist gets in and plays or just gives you a certain range of harmony and you can add melodies onto it. So these are things that we are doing when we do music together. We just may sing songs together which are of importance for that person because we know that this is now that therapist when he has spoken with that person before that this song is of value for him or for her. So there's actually it is quite interactive, situated, so you you can adapt completely to the other one in that situation. With the music you can 
play music that will cheer the person up or you can calm somebody down that is agitated in a way so you can use the properties of music in an interactive context to bring somebody to a goal that you want to set or that the other one wants to achieve. There are various different types of therapy, talking therapy, for instance, or maybe medication. Why use music to tackle a problem rather than other techniques? Music is the language of the emotions. So the way that you can say something in the music is different to using words. So I'm trying to say something now which makes sense, but if you have a very complex thing, sometimes you can say it much better like an emotion that you can't express, but if you can play it very strongly on a drum, or you can play it very gently, which is like a symbol of touching, you can express much more sensitive with your senses what is inside, which is unspeakable, what you can bring out. And that is something that makes music incredible as a tool to express yourself. So that's the emotion and then attention on what you're listening to and then joining in with others. You know, you don't need to speak. People who don't have the social techniques, talking properly, expressing, you know, what they want to say properly, they may be able just to express themselves much better in the music. So music for them is a proxy or can be a proxy to express things. I know you particularly you're interested in neurodegenerative diseases like dementia, for instance. Mm -hmm. Dementia, once dementia kicks in, then the brain degenerates. And of course, with that, then we have uh, mental health problems coming in. So you can't express what you want to say. You may not remember properly what you once knew. You may not be able to do things that you were able to do. And that, of course, is causing distress. And you're emotionally disturbed. You feel something's not working. So my body is not doing what I I'm used to do. As you can become very depressed, you will be isolated in a way and not functioning in the society as you were. And you know exactly every hour, every minute that this is the case now. And so when we use the music, we can offer a space in which all the, let's say, social techniques, conventions of everyday life is not really needed, but you are together with somebody and you can do things together and you can still be a human being. So music therapy allows you to be a human even that you have lost a lot of capabilities. And we'll be hearing more from Jürg later on. Some music therapy occurs in community settings. But some goes on in hospitals where patients can be acutely psychologically unwell. Catherine Carr is a music therapist who supports patients in hospital. And she's also a National Institute for Health Research Clinical Trials Fellow at Queen Mary University in London. Fellow Naked Scientist Adam Murphy caught up with Catherine to find out about how she uses music to help people who are having mental health difficulties. Quite often uh, we use active music making, so we have a range of musical instruments. And what we do is we work on a premise that there's no right or wrong way of playing. So people don't need to have any musical skill. Um, and what we will do is we'll get used to playing the instruments together, explore them a bit, um, and then improvise together. So we make music up. And it's the role of the therapist to support the person in um, how they sound the instruments. Afterwards, we reflect perhaps about how it felt to play, what perhaps memories or issues it brought up, um, and we relate that back to what's going on for them right now with their mental health. In terms of mental health, what kind of conditions is this good for treating? At the moment, in terms of evidence, there's very good evidence for music therapy helping schizophrenia and depression. But we work with a wide range, so from eating disorders, anxiety, and my own work is across different diagnoses within hospital care. And what does this actually do for them? How does it help them? I'd say there's probably three main ways it can be helpful. The first is just helping people to feel safe. So I think a lot of people know about the capacity of music to help to relax or to calm. And so quite often it's working with very strong emotions, whether it's anxiety or anger, and helping to find a way of expressing and regulating that. 
The second is it's that it's motivating. So it's a really good way of starting to relate to another person or people if you're in a group. And the third way is it's also enjoyable. A lot of people have lifelong love of music um, and it can be a really useful way of reconnecting back to that in day-to-day life. And is this something that helps make long-term changes or is it a short-term management of mental illnesses? In terms of research evidence, we only really have evidence for up to a, about a year afterwards um, and that's, that's quite often due to how the studies have been designed. Um, so we do know that it can have a, an impact, certainly you know, within the year after having had music therapy. I think anecdotally you talk to people and the changes that are experienced can be perhaps broader than what you would measure in a study. So people can talk about how it's changed um, an aspect of their lives or improved their quality of life. And some of those can be very long-standing. Do we know much about what's actually going on in the brain? What evidence is there for what music therapy physically does? What's tricky with the evidence around the brain is that quite often these are sort of very controlled studies. We do know that specific types of music have different impacts on the brain. We know that when we listen to or partake in music, uh, this works with the reward and motivation centers in the brain. So we know that it's something that is intrinsically rewarding for people. We also know that when we make music as musicians, that we're using lots of different parts of the brain, which go beyond those that we use in language. So certainly for things like brain injury, there are ways that music can actually bypass damaged areas of the brain. Whilst that might not sound so relevant to mental health care, certainly if you're working with things like dementia, you can see it very visibly in how people remember songs or um, how people reconnect to old memories through hearing music that they've perhaps known in the past. Like what kind of things? What What do you see? For example, again, working on a ward, people can be very disorientated in dementia, particularly because they're outside of their home context. So a song that they perhaps know or remember can mean that they go from being very withdrawn, very low to starting to communicate with other people. They'll certainly remember all the words to the songs. And so you can have these very lovely shared experiences with people on the ward. And quite often that leads to talking about aspects of their lives that are important that you wouldn't get in conversation without having had that musical uh, interaction. Catherine Carr there. Now to delve deeper into the neuroscientific evidence of music therapy, I returned to Jürg, who told me what he's currently working on. Well, the brain research into music therapy is starting. We do more and more. There's a lot of research investigating particular uh, scenarios and then see how that is, you know, changing the brain. But what we've seen, for instance, in a depression study that we've done in Finland, when you look at asymmetries of the brain, for instance, that the group that received music therapy in the resting state recording, so the one which is not related to any activity, just when you sit and have your eyes closed, and that is showing how the brain is wide in the moment, was different after music therapy for 20 times, two times, one hour per week. So it had an influence on the brain processing per se. And that is something that that is quite important. And we have more and more studies that show that music, first of all, doesn't uh, change the brain. We know that the training changes the brain, but then that the doing music is making a difference even with short dosages, to brain activity. And that is uh, that is very promising. And that's why we're doing the research into that. And that's why we, for instance, also look in how it is when we interact in music. Now, just across from us, you have some EEG traces, I think, on a screen. Are you doing some research right now? Exactly. My colleague, uh, Dr. Maitov, is uh, currently investigating a improvisation that a dementia patient has done and we had two EEG caps on the hearts of the therapist and on the patient and then they were playing music together, they were drumming and then we recorded the electroencephalogram, so the brain activity. So what we are looking at is now how when we are playing music together and we're joining in, let's say the patient plays duck and and then the therapist also plays duck, you know, and then the therapist goes on 
and then maybe the the patient tries to join in and then the therapist adapts to the way of the playing of the patient and then at some point where you are in a synchronized way that you're playing together that it comes from whatever to something like that you know <laughs> and uh, when you experience that you can do that you know, well, you're still a human being. You're still in touch with others in the way you use music in the playing. And there's moments in the music therapy where there's a bit more of a dense, uh, let's say, encounter so that the person has insight. And we know from psychotherapy research that when people change and they find out about themselves in the therapy that there are certain moments which have a bit of a different quality and we are very much interested how that quality looks like in the brain and what it is that makes it happen because we are convinced and not only us it is what the therapists do that there is parts in the therapy which are more important which have more meaning and which are core to the change that music therapy does and with the eg which is giving us an ongoing signal of the brain's activity we can trace that and can show and can identify that and that's what we have there on the screen jörg fachner who's working on describing what's happening in the brains of therapists and clients when they interact and it'll be interesting to see what he finds out so far, we've considered music therapy in the context of psychological illness. But what about physical illness? Does music therapy have a role to play there? Alex Street thinks so. He's a music therapist and researcher who specialises in aiding recovery from nervous system injury, known as neurorehabilitation. He also works at the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research at Anglia Ruskin University, as well as on the stroke ward at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. A stroke, as unfortunately many of us might know, is a life-threatening condition that involves blood supply being cut off in parts of the brain. As a result, cells die and functionality, including things like perhaps speech or movement on one side of the body, can be lost. But a bit like a diversion route that can help you navigate around roadworks on your car journey, interventions for stroke rehabilitation can help find another route through the brain, making use of different connections or helping to repair the damaged ones. So what does any of this got to do with music therapy? Let's say it's affected their left side, the left side of their brain, where the the parts for, for speech are mainly represented, and so they can't speak anymore. But because of singing being something that is, it uses both halves of the brain and more of the whole brain, sometimes somebody who can't speak can actually sing instead. If it's quite a mild stroke, those language areas aren't completely destroyed, it can be as simple as saying, sing what you want to say and beat your left hand to regulate your speech rate. I've encountered this sometimes where I can say, well, if you could have anything to, to eat now, what would you eat? And I've assessed that they can understand language, but they just can't speak. And they'll be able to tap and say, a cheese sandwich. And so then they can use that as a strategy to help them to communicate. And sometimes then there's some spontaneous recovery and sometimes they need to do more of those kinds of exercises so that those parts of the brain actually become repaired or they use other pathways, other connections in the brain that then become more strongly connected with the speech areas. It sounds like it's almost this kind of innate mechanism that we've got. I don't know if that's, yeah, if that's massively is. accurate. It feels like yeah. it should be. Yes, well, we, we can all perceive rhythm. We can tell when there's a regular beat, depending on how damaged certain areas are. We can tell when there's a, a change in rhythm. So from something like... to It's the, the structure of music and the way that the brain is activated by music. So music is processed globally by the whole brain. And that also means, and this has been found in various research, that we can draw out certain elements of music and use them to um, support rehabilitation. So, for example, walking is the most rhythmic movement that we do. If you have had a stroke and you can't walk very well, if you set a metronome or a very simple piece of music to the existing speed of walking, 
like that, and you set the metronome or the music to that tempo, then as soon as they start walking to it, their balance improves and the angles at which their legs are moving also have been found to improve. They can entrain to that beat or that music set to that tempo and it can gradually be increased towards a normal walking pace. So that's rhythm. What about melody, though? Can melody be used to help people recover from physical damage? Yeah, there's a, an intervention called melodic intonation therapy. And that's for people who have aphasia. And so, again, that's where the left side, where language is predominantly connected, and it affects word finding so that people might be speaking jargon and they might not know that. They might even not be able to monitor that they're doing that. It's not certain yet whether it's the melody or the, the rhythm that supports speech recovery. But certainly for some people, singing what they want to say, they can do. Or you can sing a song to them that will be very overlearned. So you mentioned something about music being an innate part of us. Well, actually, we do grow up and, and we're exposed to rhythm, you know, because that's the way our bodies work. We have pulse, we have breathing rate, heartbeat. And also nursery rhymes and songs are a common part across cultures and it's often accompanied by rhythmic, rhythmic rocking. So sometimes you'll be singing to the, your infant and rocking them on your lap as well. You can use those songs with people who've had a stroke. Sometimes it might be something like Row Your Boat or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or something like that. And it's because it's so overlearned that they might be able to sing star at the end of the line or they might be able to come in somewhere else. And so that's the beginning of them starting to use to access language again. And so you'll do lots of those singing exercises and you can use, as I said, the structure of music and the structure of song to help them start relearning. And the key to neurorehabilitation is repetition. It's massed practice of the right thing. Any musician will know that they've achieved those skills in moving their fingers and whatever skills are needed to play the instrument that they're playing through hours and hours and hours of practice. As someone who learnt the cello for a number of years, I can completely relate to that. A lot of practice. Anybody who's working in neurorehabilitation is trying to do the same with that patient. They're trying to give them the government recommendation 45 minutes a day, five days a week, for as long as improvement can be observed or measured. I worked with somebody who now is, is doing very well and had very little movement in, in the left arm. We ran a group every week that was co-facilitated by physiotherapy assistants. It's been running for over a year now. I saw him individually sometimes, but mainly in the group and his range of movement, so how far he could reach, how, what, how he could grasp, um, the whole movement has increased dramatically. And he didn't really have any other arm rehabilitation while he was there. It's really devastating for people when they, when they have something like a stroke. You know, it's not from a, an accident or something. It, it just, just happens, you know, so it's particularly cruel event really to, to experience. If we talk about the theoretical um, person who's had a stroke, I'm guessing they're on all sorts of other interventions. Phys physiotherapy maybe, maybe they're on medication. Where does music therapy fit in? Let's say somebody can't move their arm very well. So often with stroke, one half of the body will be affected. So being asked to repeat the same arm movement again and again and again in physio, and so they do use other things like sports equipment and things like that, if they're doing it to a beat, it actually becomes much easier because it's a temporal framework. They know when they've got to move their arm, when it's going to hit the target or the object that they're going to try and grasp and pick up, and then when it returns back again. So that's one thing. The other thing is that you can then do that as an interaction. So I might be playing something with a very strong pulse while they're performing that arm movement. And that arm movement results in them playing an instrument. So they reach out and they hit a drum, boom, like that. And I'm playing a chord sequence or something on the guitar while they're doing that. And so they're not actually as conscious of how much they're repeating that movement because they're playing music with me by performing that arm movement. If you're playing a piece of music at 60 beats per minute 
and the person is hitting a drum on every beat in a 4-4 time, and you do that for three minutes, that's 180 times that they've hit that drum. If they can move that quickly at that point, often you have to do it on every first beat in, in that, uh, that sort of tempo setting. So if you then do that for another 10 minutes, they're getting more of that massed practice that is going to change the, the um, parts of the brain that need to be changed. So they're, they're recruiting new cells where the damaged cells were. How widespread is music therapy in this clinical hospital setting? Well, not very much, and there are several reasons for that. So the predominant teaching of music therapy in, in the UK and Europe uses a model of music improvisation. It's more centred on the relationship with the music therapist rather than what needs changing in the brain. That is gradually changing, so there's this growing body of neuroscientific evidence that shows using brain imaging and EEG how the brain responds to rhythm, melody, harmony, whole pieces of music. It would be brilliant if at acute stage every patient has an iPad next to their bed. It has the music-based exercises, the neuropsych, the OT, the speech therapy exercise, everything that they need when they're discharged. All of that is transferred onto a tablet that they have at home. The data is still collected so we know that they're doing the exercises and that they're responding to them. That's my dream project and that's what I'm working on with the other team um, at Addenbrooke's as well. There are some really good companies that we're partnering with in Cambridge that have secure data collection and data transfer systems set up. More research needs to be done certainly but it does sound very exciting. That was Alex Street and sadly that's all we've got time for this month. Thank you to Alex Street, Jörg Fachner Catherine Carr, Helen Keyes and Duncan Assel. And thanks to you for listening to Naked Neuroscience. Have you got an idea for an episode? Is there something you'd like us to cover? Get in touch. You can follow us via the Naked Scientist social media accounts. We're at Naked Scientists. Or you can email direct. It's neuroscience at nakedscientists.com. We'll be back next month with more Naked Neuroscience. But until then, I've been Katie Haler from the Naked Scientist team. Happy Easter and goodbye. Thank you.